for, for this wrap-up session, we have discussed several ways to do this. We did prepare some uh, brief summaries of our presentations with the high points uh, for each presentation on one slide. Um, but we also don't want to leave any questions unanswered or, or any possibilities for um, audience participation. So we could, uh, we could go through these first, uh, or we could just hear from all of you what you would like to do with the time that remains. I want to say from my own perspective, you've been a great group to, per to participate and very, very good about asking questions and listening and attending all the sessions, and we appreciate that as speakers. see them. Well, if, I, if, if you didn't hear me say it often enough, fetal growth rates are high and you need more protein than we usually give them. Um, does anybody have a question about that? So how many of you came here thinking that uh, or ha how many of you came here from your own nurseries, intensive care units, giving three to four grams per kilo per day of amino acids starting on day one. one. How many on day two? How many on day three? When you go back home, how many of you are going to start three to four grams per kilo per day of amino acids on day one in 24 to 30 week babies? A, f a few more. I'm glad it's still controversial in your minds. Um, I don't think any of us said things that are as absolute uh, as uh, we'd like to have in medicine. Um, the, uh, the other point that I would make is that uh, the amino acid uh, requirements of the newborn should be considered in the same regard as how the fetus gets its amino acids by being pumped into the fetus at rates and to concentrations higher than they probably need for protein growth and the balance is taken care of by normal urinary excretion and uh, the opposite of what we usually do, we infuse lots of glucose and not enough amino acids. And oh, here we go. Um, the main reason for babies not growing after birth for long periods at the same rates they could have grown if they'd stayed in the uterus as a normal healthy fetus is simply that we don't feed them what they were getting in, uter in, in utero. Oxygen deficiency is something that we should pay more attention to. We have more than enough partial pressure of oxygen, but we don't have necessarily enough blood oxygen content and perhaps another whole series of Hippocrates seminars could deal with transfusion-related problems and how to keep blood oxygen content normal. And I'd remind you that the one organ that we seem to have the least information about, but as humans we think may be the most important, is the most metabolically active and the largest metabolically active organ, and that's the brain. And uh, there isn't a study yet that I know of that doesn't show that undernutrition causes the failure of normal growth rates of brain neurons and their interconnections. So those are the main points I'd make about what you learn from fetal studies to apply to babies born at the same gestational age, uh, but before, before term. Anybody want to challenge him on any of these points? <laughs> 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 he always say, what do you want to ask? <laughs> you, shouldn't, you shouldn't ask. <laughs> so uh, what about this brain sparing effect? I mean, uh, because you said you don't give in sufficient nutrients. And I know that then when you have any problem, if, if you are an IUGR or a, possibly a, a stressed baby, then the circulation is centralized and uh, this brain sparing phenomenon in order everything to go to the brain and the heart. Yes. Uh, 
So brain sparing is a well-described phenomenon, uh, but not very well studied in terms of mechanisms. So you bring up two points. Um, first is that brain sparing is a relative term. All IUGR babies that have significant IUGR have smaller than normal brains with fewer neurons and fewer uh, neuronal interconnections. But the brain is not as reduced in growth as the length and not as reduced in growth as the weight. Uh, so don't think that the brain is totally spared. It's only relatively spared. And that's something that we all should remember. Undernutrition, particularly of amino acids, protein, restricts the growth of brain just as much as it or not as much, but it does it in the same way that other organs are affected. Um, there's the assumption that the acute phenomenon of acute hypoxia in the fetus, which changes the circulation by restricting peripheral blood flow and centralizing it to the coronary arteries, the adrenals, and the brain, will be sufficient for producing normal growth of the brain. But remember, the, brain, the blood is still hypoxic. So even though blood flow is redirected, the blood oxygen content is still low. So there may not be sufficient amounts of oxygen for normal brain growth and development. Also, those studies were done acutely. There's less evidence that a long-term lower oxygen concentration does the same thing. For example, infants of di fetuses of diabetic mothers also have low oxygen concentrations, but nobody's ever documented an abnormal bl brain blood flow in those babies, either low or high. So I think the long-term effects of oxygen deficiency on Train, uh, on redirecting blood flow to the brain are still yet to, uh, yet to show us anything. So th those are good questions because they raise some points that uh, I didn't get into in detail. Yeah, any, anything else? Yeah, that was a good question. <laughs> yes. We were about to change our policy in our unit concerning the total parental nutrition. And I was almost convinced before coming here that we have to increase the protein and probably start from three grams from the very first day. Still, I'm not quite sure what to do with the lipids because I discussed with you separately, which one of you. And um, I think uh, not all of you agree on starting with three grams of lipids on the first day. So what would, would you suggest for us to do? That's Since we're going to change everything. That's in my next slide, okay. uh, which is the, TP, the okay. intravenous nutrition okay. talk. We'll to so we'll get to that. But okay. real quickly, uh, the reason we disagree, I won't say, we don't disagree, we just have different answers. Because the practice is not as certain. We have much better evidence for what you need for amino acids, because that's based on pretty rational experimental data. But there really is not rational experimental data for lipids. For example, in animal models, lipids are not transferred across the placenta like they are in humans. And as I showed you in one of those figures, lipid concentration in fetuses of animal models are really pretty low. So how do you measure the normal transport rate, the uptake rate of lipids by the normal human fetus? And how do you distinguish between that and total lipid production, fat production, which could come from a synthesis from glucose and glycerol? We don't have those measures in the human fetus like we do for animal models showing us what amino acids and glucose are doing. So that's experimental, experimental evidence that could guide us as to what the normal fetus of 24, 30 weeks gestation might be, need for, uh, for lipid uptake. So I think that's why we do not always agree because we don't have what Joe, Dr. New spoke about is and Dr. Bell spoke about, we don't have the evidence. But I think, I think we do agree that you don't want to wait longer than two or three days to start some lipid. No, no, I mean, to start from the first day, but probably with one gram, just to be on the safe side. If, 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 if one is all you can convince your colleagues for, it's a good start. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to take a slightly different uh, tack, and uh, I'm going to give you a test. True, false. Okay. Uh, first question. The preterm newborns has levels of gastric acid that are very high 
and H2 blockers need to be used to protect the intestine. False. Okay. Does everybody agree? False? Okay. Very good. <laughs> okay. Any questions or issues with that? Okay. Second question. Carbohydrates other than lactose need to be used in formulas for preterm infants because lactase activities are low. False. Okay. You guys are good. <laughs> Good students. Bile acid concentrations in the intestine of very low birth weight infants are low. This is very important for MCT hydrolysis. Okay. The uh, bile acid concentrations are low. That is correct. But the second part of the statement, this is very important for MCT hydrolysis. Number one, they're not important for MCT emulsification and bile acids do not hydrolyze. It's enzymes that hydrolyze the lipids. Okay? Good. Um, it is now clear that erythromycin should be used routinely in babies with feeding intolerance. You guys are good. Okay, so they're all false. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, true or false? <laughs> Trace elements and vitamins are required in small amounts. Lack of intake can cause health problems. Iron is important for brain development. <laughs> you're, you're doing very well. <laughs> They're all true. Uh, these are the, the points that I took to be the most important, the pearls from these oysters that you should take out of the oyster and take home and put them on your necklace. Um, there is much more that we said about each of these uh, elements and vitamins, and uh, you can refer to the presentation for the details. But if you remember just the things on this slide, I think it's going to be a, you'll, you'll have had success for this particular presentation. <clears throat> uh, Iron is, <clears throat> iron is important for brain development and important to know that iron deficiency that affects brain development can occur without anemia. Yes, yeah, so you don't, you don't want to wait until the baby's anemia to start thinking about iron. Uh, Preterm infants are born deficient in fat-soluble vitamins, that's true, because they're deficient in fat, so they don't have places to store the fat-soluble vitamins. Uh, vitamin A supplementation can reduce BPD risk. You've heard that from several of us, so if, you, if you've missed that, you haven't been paying attention. And uh, lastly, vitamin E supplementation can reduce interventricular hemorrhage risk. Also true, okay. It is a little bit controversial. This is our own They're applied in modern ICUs with surfactant and I'm sorry, which is, which is controversial? I, you're correct. I don't because think many people do. Yeah, I think these studies are very old. Uh, yeah. Uh, before surfactant era and uh, without the resuscitation we do now, uh, giving uh, a lot of uh, yeah. uh, prenates and uh, beta methods. Okay, but but you got, but but did you say true or false? <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. But. But the answer I wanted you to say was true, but, and, and you, have a, you have a right to disagree, and um, we can talk more offline, but there are three meta-analyses that make this point. Granted, they were mostly older studies, but that doesn't mean they're invalid. Surfactant doesn't necessarily change everything, and we're doing another study now. Uh, vitamin E is potentially toxic. Oh, Uh, in, in some of the studies from the 1970s, babies who received large doses every day for many days who had serum tocopherol levels greater than 3.5 milligrams per deciliter epidemiologically had an increased risk of 
necrotizing enterocolitis and sepsis. And there are possible mechanisms to explain that. Um, like any, any fat-soluble vitamin, if you take enough of it, can have harmful effects. But that's true of almost every nutrient. The only reason water-soluble vitamins are a little bit safer is the kidney helps to get rid of the excess if you take too much. Look on the, on the, on the handout. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very different if it's, if it's enteral or parenteral. Enteral dose for, um, for newborns is 5 to 25 international units per day. Uh, parenteral, you have to be much more careful to dose it correctly, and it should be 2.8 international units per kilogram per day. And I can tell you that at least one-third of the NICUs in the United States are not dosing it correctly. They're following the manufacturer recommendations, which says put a certain amount, uh, give a certain amount per day for all babies under 1,000 grams, regardless of their weight. I think the real controversy, at least in our program, that came up is that most everybody recognizes that the severe intracranial hemorrhages occur in the first three to four days of life in very small and unstable babies, and the chances of making a difference to change that problem with vitamin E the way we usually give it, uh, particularly if you're using enteral dosing, is uh, not going to make an impact. What do you think? Uh, um that, that's right. Uh, baby, preterm babies are born deficient in vitamin E. If you want to protect them from IVH, you have to correct that deficiency quickly. Uh, and the way we do it is to give a single dose of vitamin E at birth, just like we do with vitamin K. And it brings the level up uh, to normal uh, within a few hours. Uh, this has not been studied, so I didn't present this to you as an evidence-based practice. But uh, we're doing the study now. The, 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 the Aaron Krantz, all of these, most of the studies that show an effect on IVH were done to study other things. Either Aaron Krantz actually was looking to reduce chronic lung disease. Uh, the Philadelphia studies and the, and the Houston studies were done to reduce retinopathy. And vitamin E does have a beneficial effect in reducing retinopathy, but it takes a very high dose. It's probably not safe for general use. Uh, it, it also... Um, there are some other beneficial effects, but those are the main things. Uh, so it, it's a much more complicated vitamin than what most people realize. Yes? We give this, that single dose of vitamin E at birth without a, additional iron, but we, we, we do give iron uh, as we've discussed before, we do supplement uh, breastfed babies with iron. Uh, once you get past the, the first few days, the, you don't need to give extra vitamin E because there's enough in the parental multivitamins that we use, at least the ones in North America, and uh, if you dose it correctly. And, uh, and the premature infant formulas and uh, human milk contain adequate vitamin E. So it's mainly, if you're interested in protecting the baby from hemorrhage, it's that first day that you really have to be primarily concerned. Uh, enteral. Uh, the dose that we give is, uh, is 30 international units per kilogram of, of uh, Aquasol E, which is 50 international units per ml, and we dilute that one-to-one -one with water. So we're giving two cc's per kilo. I, I don't want you to necessarily adopt this practice. I'm just telling you that that is the way we decided is probably without risk and may help to correct this deficiency state faster. We're trying to, uh, we're planning a study to do in the NIH network to try to answer this. And so in a few years, we'll have better information.
So early parenteral nutrition, early means starting at birth because when you cut the umbilical cord, the baby now needs supplemental nutrition when it's very young. Uh, we've talked about the protein dose. Um, there's my dose of lipid, at least that's what we do in our program. Um, whether you should give 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5, or 3, um, future research may tell us more than we know today. Uh, the glucose infusion rate, I put a little lower rate because I think it's easier to adjust it up than it is to get it down. And many of these babies have hyperglycemia right after birth due to stress reactive hormones and giving too much glucose. But you should adjust it frequently in response to glucose concentration measurements. And I just put down the range of values that I think most of us would say puts you in a, in a range that probably will not cause trouble. And that uh, while you're talking about intravenous nutrition, don't forget that by itself it's inadequate and has problems associated with it. So it may be life-saving, but it's uh, not life-perfecting. So go ahead and get started on your trophic feeds. Um, I just wanted to make a, a little point about the lipids. Uh, uh, there's a, a couple different ways that one can handle uh, when, a situation when there's a lack of evidence. You know, you can err one way or err the other way. And uh, I, I think I tried to go through a, uh, a, a rationale for you that showed that uh, uh, if you provide lipids starting very early, that you have a increment in energy in that first week, an increment of energy of about 13 uh, calories per kilo per day. And if you look at the studies that were done by Bora and colleagues, uh, they saw for every 10 calories per kilo per day, a 4.5 point increase in MDI at 18 months. So I, you know, I think that this is one of the, uh, the issues that what we're trying to get you to, uh, we're all trying to give early nutrition and to use the, uh, the, this sort of a golden opportunity, golden hour of providing nutrition for these babies. And I guess if I'm going to err one way or the other without evidence, my error would be to uh, give the lipids early. Uh, so far, we have some evidence that we do have some evidence in small studies. The Ibrahim study that does not show any complications, and we have some other studies that do not show complications with the early introduction of lipids. So there is some evidence basis, but I have to agree with Bill, the evidence is not that strong. Uh, but most of the practice that we have right now is based on tradition rather than science. And if I'm going to err in one direction or the other, I'm going to err on giving more lipid early. Um, I'll, I'll take a little different tact. Um, my, my approach to lipid uh, hasn't changed over the last 25 years as I've waited for new evidence to emerge. But my, the way I started out uh, in my career was based on animal research, which uh, shows that uh, toxicity from lipid emulsion is not related so much to the amount per day, but the maximum hourly infusion rate. And if you, uh, for, for everyone except the very small growth restricted infant, uh, you're gonna be okay if you, if you stay at an infusion rate of 0 0.2 grams per kilogram per hour of lipid, uh, which if you, if you give that um, at uh, over 20 hours a day, it's gonna give you two grams per kilogram per day. Um, the, the toxicity in the acute toxicity in, in animals occurred above uh, 0 0.25 milligrams per kilogram per hour. So I, uh, we did an, uh, 10 years ago start with 0 0.5 and then go to 1.0 and then 1.5 and then 2. So by the third day we were at 2. Now we start at 2. I haven't seen any problems that we've recognized, uh, but rarely go above to accept in the full-term baby with, um, with a mechanical intestinal problem that requires uh, a long period of TPN. So that's just a slightly different point of view, but uh, based on the limited evidence that we have. But you're also introducing early enteral feeds. Yeah, yeah we, 
We, uh, <clears throat> that two grams per kilogram per day will give you 42 kilocalories per kilogram per day. Uh, <clears throat> and with the additional dextrose and amino acids, we can get somewhere between 90 and 110 kilocalories per kilogram per day, but we also start enteral feeding uh, as soon as we can get colostrum, uh, generally on the day of birth. So we don't rely on the parental nutrition so much. Oh, yes, we have it. When they gave proteins that were um, with low calories, like, like one gram of protein with less than 17 kilocalories, this is the, uh, uh, the ratio, uh, they found later on in the follow-up that these babies had the neurological problems. I don't know if you, so she, com she commended that, she recommended that in order to, to avoid uh, uh, high um, levels of um, uh, amino acids in the serum, we should give a, a ratio of one gram per of uh, amino acids with at least 17 kilocalories, or even more kilocalories, but not less than that. Yes, and at low, remember that, fi that cartoon I showed you, um, every protein intake, the, the effect of energy plateaus above around, any, it depends on whether it's intravenous or, or enteral, but let's say somewhere above 70 kilocalories per kilo per day, 70 to 80. The, the effect of energy on protein balance stops, but below that there is an impact of energy on promoting nitrogen balance and protein balance. So what, in the first few days of life, as, as both Dr. Bell and Dr. New have pointed out, and you're mentioning Dr. Kashyap, you should be providing enough energy to metabolize the amino acids. Otherwise, the amino acids will be oxidized and therefore less available for, their, for protein synthesis. So low levels of protein, high levels of protein, you still need energy at, if you're in a low energy range. So you can start more energy early. My observation is that we're usually giving excess glucose much more than the four to six that I talk about, and the baby's producing glucose, and they're usually hyperglycemic, so their energy balance is usually quite positive. I have a one question. The rule that which says that uh, calories from proteins uh, are about 20% than non-protein calories are not applied to premature babies? Um, we don't count calories from proteins in our calorie and in our energy balance. We count carbohydrate and lipid only because if you're giving enough carbohydrate and lipid, then the, the protein will be, the, the, the oxidation of the amino acids will be quite low. Please, can you repeat, uh, I, can you repeat uh, this, this statement? Yes, at, um, when you have sufficient calories, energy calories from carbohydrate and lipid, then you do not oxidize amino acids very much. So we do not count total energy, total calories per kilo per day in, to include amino acids. We assume that their oxidation is very low. Now, if you're giving very low energy supply, 0.5 grams per kilo per day of lipids and um, two or three to four milligrams per kilo per minute of glucose, you're going to be energy deficient and then you will metabolize the amino acids. Uh, but for the most part, if we're giving sufficient energy, then we do not count the amino acid uh, calories because they're generally not being oxidized. So there is no calories from amino acids, from protein? Uh, if you have sufficient calories from carbohydrate and lipid, then you do not oxidize your amino acids. I mean, we, many people have done these experiments lots of times. You can watch the leucine oxidation rate go right down to zero as you raise your glucose intake and your lipid intake. So um, 
you know, there are probably always some amino acids being oxidized, but you minimize those. So for our energy purposes, we do not count the amino acids and their potential supply of energy because for the most part, they're either synthesized into protein, which requires more energy, or they're uh, you're passed out in the urine. But in the first days, in the first days, maybe uh, calories from carbohydrate and uh, from lipids are about uh, 40%. And uh, more, let, let, me, let, me, let me try to answer it a different way. If you're giving a baby 80, ml, 80 kilocalories per kilogram per day intravenously and four grams of amino acid per kilogram per day, that's 20% roughly of your energy that you administer in, through the IV is from amino acids. It's not the same as what's oxidized in the body. But I think that rule of thumb of, of 20%, the way you're thinking about it, probably is not a bad rule because if you go higher than four grams of amino acid with only 80 calories, you, you, you probably aren't going to utilize the amino acids for protein synthesis. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, really, carbon is, doesn't matter where carbon comes from. It comes from amino acids, lipids, and glucose. And that's what is oxidized for energy production. So if you give more carbon from glucose and lipids than is necessary for metabolic rate, for oxygen consumption, amino acids will not be oxidized. That's why I do not count that energy supply from the amino acids, even though you could say of the total amount of carbon going into the body at four grams per kilo per day and 80 kilocalories per kilo per day of non-protein calories, 20% uh, would be accounted for by amino acids. Just remember that the oxidation of carbon doesn't matter where it comes from. It's all competitive. So any, if you give more glucose and more lipids, you will reduce the metabolism, the, the oxidation of amino acids, and make them more s available for protein synthesis. And that's really what your goal is. If you, if you, it's hard to make a baby hyperglycemic if you're giving them amino acids too, in my experience. We, we, we used to see that problem in the very preterm babies, but now that we start amino acids right away, we don't see it very much. Okay, this was the uh, presentation on evidence to guide clinical practice. There are only a few points that I think are really crucial here. Uh, just remember that the highest levels of evidence are the randomized controlled trial and the systematic review with meta-analysis such as the Cochrane reviews. Remember where to find the Cochrane, the neonatal Cochrane reviews um, on this website. Did, did anybody have trouble getting them there? Did you, did you try it? It should work. I, I, I understand one of the other websites I gave you doesn't work. You have to have a password and I apologize for that. <clears throat> uh, the number needed to treat is the number of babies that you have to give the new treatment to to prevent, uh, to accomplish one effective result. Uh, and we talked about that for uh, antenatal corticosteroids and for vitamin A. And the number needed to treat you can calculate as one over the absolute risk difference. So if you reduce uh, the uh, bad outcome from 40% to 30%, that's a 10, that's a 0 0.10 or 10% absolute risk reduction. So the number needed to treat is, is 10. It's one divided by that. Um, in assessing new therapies, you should consider the number needed to treat, the number needed to harm, which I talked about only briefly, and the relative value of the response to therapy and the adverse effects. And I think all of us do this. We just haven't thought about it analytically and described it in these terms. You want to know what's the potential benefit, what's the chance that's going to help, and how important is that benefit, and what are the risks that you're taking by giving this treatment to your patients. You know, I haven't mentioned the cost. 
And, and that's a different type of analysis that I don't uh, want to talk about and, and we rarely talk about in the U.S. as neonatologists, but we're starting to be forced to talk about that. Any questions or comments? And now, uh, Professor Hay asked if you were going to go home and change your, your parental nutrition practices. And so that, uh, that really gets to the question of how do you make that transition from evidence to practice. And even if you are convinced as an individual, it's not necessarily the same as going back and telling your chief and your colleagues, this is what we're going to do now. Okay, so, oh, it's easy then for you. <laughs> but this is, you're all here representing uh, groups, and uh, so you have to uh, work with your group and, uh, and explain the group, explain uh, the rationale and the evidence to the group and get their buy-in or their agreement. And uh, as uh, Professor Martin said, even the nurses uh, have to understand why you're making a change so that they will also support it. colleagues attending the three-day meeting, so well, you're very they lucky. are most convinced. You're, you're, the, you're the lucky one. So eight persons. Because many person. people here are the only Who one. Is it the hospital? <laughs> We're 19 altogether. So. Okay, let's move to the next topic. So in discussing the intestinal immune defenses, my take home points from that lecture was that I wanted to impress upon you that the postnatal intestinal adaptation of the preterm infant is modulated by our practices. So for us just to think about what we're doing at the bedside, the rationale behind it, and understanding what we do and what we don't do affects intestinal development. And that so both the medical and nutritional practices that we've talked about and that these changes and sort of waiting to see and, and, um, and uh, delaying sort of some of those decisions can have a cost and these changes that we see in intestinal development can be observed within days after birth. And that these changes play a role in the risk of disease that we see. Disease early in uh, the short-term morbidities that we often see in the NICU but also uh, locally, systemically, and long term. So things that we do have um, extensive ramifications. And that the gut, the gut can definitely act as a motor of chronic illness. So we need to respect the gut. <laughs> oh, yeah. Questions? Challenges? <laughs> <laughs> okay, <clears throat> feeding the brain. We actually had two presentations that, that were closely related uh, that deal with the impact of uh, nutrition on uh, brain development and function. And uh, <clears throat> from my presentation, remember that better early nutrition improves brain development, <clears throat> that better growth leads to better brain function, and these first two points are closely related, obviously. <clears throat> Third, that human milk is the best for the brain. And fourth, that specific nutrients play important role, important roles in brain development, uh, and especially iron, long-chain omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids such as DHA, but also a few other nutrients that we mentioned. Any questions about these? Okay. So back to lipids. Um, as we've all tried to reinforce that it's essential as an alternative fuel source, especially to prevent the essential fatty acid deficiency. I did put safe to start at three grams per kilo per day, in deference to my colleague, Dr. New, but in our unit, similar to Dr. Hay, we start a little bit lower. But we have been actually transforming our practice over the past 10, 12 years that I've been there, starting at day two at 0.5, and then starting at day two at one, and then starting day two at one and a half, and now we start at day one. 
And no, I haven't seen any, you know, obvious ramifications or results or consequences of starting earlier and at higher amounts. But um, I am also not convinced that the evidence is there either way, that it's safe or that it's not safe. And I think the more, and I think we may not even be asking the right questions and thinking about the safety of lipids, or at least not yet, because there's a lot to be done there. But again, it's a balance, and I, and I do agree with that. I just want to make sure that early on I'm providing enough energy to support some growth. And I'll worry about the other stuff with my research and hopefully others to figure out what we should be providing, which goes into point three, is that I don't think we're providing the right thing. And that's what makes, I think, what I struggle with, with lipid delivery in the NICU. And so I've showed you what we provide and how it just, uh, you know, <coughs> completely inadequately provides the baby with what they've been exposed to in utero. And, I, and what I sort of, uh, an illustration of maybe we're not measuring the right things or understanding what we should measure about tolerance to lipids is that when I, I showed you in that first week how the, the DHA, as an example, dramatically fell. When I cut that and looked at every day for those infants, the biggest drop was at day four. If I look at my practices, I start at day two and I'm at my highest grams per kilo per day at the time, that's when we started, at day four. So again, we're pouring in this omega-6. Is that, was that the precipitator of the drop at that time point? I don't know, but those are the kind of questions I think that we should ask when thinking about lipid delivery moving forward. But it is what it is. It's the product that we have right now. And the, the evidence about providing energy and somatic growth and supporting the short and long-term outcomes as a result of that is, is too strong to deny until we have a better alternative. Only about lipids. Uh, uh, as we finish with discussing the amino acids and the lipids, I would like to have your opinion. In cases that we have tiny babies, let's say 600 grams or 700 grams, in um, acute renal failure, failure with BUN of 200, 250, creatinine 1.52, and also babies with holostasis two different situations and increased liver enzymes, how would you handle those babies concerning the um, uh, amount of amino acids and lipids that you would give to those babies in acute, severe renal failure and in uh, uh, cholestasis, yes. I'll take a start with that. With severe acute renal failure, I think you treat these babies the same way that you do older children and adults. Um, if you're in a toxic range or very close to it with respect to ammonia and uh, urea, then you probably should give less in the way of protein. So if you're giving amino acids intravenously, back off. Remembering that if you give less than one and a half grams per kilo per day to these small babies, they will start breaking down their own protein and that will contribute to urea production and ammonia as well. What do you do with liver enzyme abnormalities? Um, you have to remember that the urea cycle is based on intact uh, hepatocytes. So as enzymes tend to go up, um, generally if uh, there's enough damage, you'll see the ammonia go up. So as you, I, I think that's another good guide. So we tend to measure the ammonia when we see uh, enzymes go up um, and then treat accordingly, lower the amino acid infusion rates until we're, not, until we're just close to one and a half grams per kilo per day. Hopefully this will be transient because while you're lowering your amino acid supply uh, to protect the baby from the toxicity of ammonia and other factors, um, you're limiting the potential for brain cell growth and development. So it is a balance. Personally, I don't go below two grams per kilo per day of amino acids. Um, and then cholestasis. Um, well, the best way to treat cholestasis is to allow the gallbladder to decompress, which means you have to have an intact uh, stomach, duodenum, and upper jejunum. And uh, if you can feed at least that far, um, you'll probably get some results in reducing uh, the problem with cholestasis. Um, if, if you have a situation where you absolutely cannot feed enterally and you can't decompress the gallbladder, 
um, then intravenous nutrition becomes a balance between saving the baby's life and causing further difficulties. Those are rare, but they are serious, and I'm not sure I have a better answer for that. I've yet to see any manipulation of the way in which we infuse lipids, um, do a fast feed cycle approach, or uh, uh, use the uh, enzymes, uh, use, use taurine or the various uh, uh, cholic acid issues, uh, me mechanisms. I haven't seen those make any difference, even though our gastroenterology experts tell us that we should be using them. Maybe somebody else can provide their ideas. No, I haven't seen any problem. I mean, I would guide that again just the same way. If your triglycerides are going progressively higher and higher, then for some reason the lipids are not being metabolized, and so I slow down the lipid infusion rate until I get to a normal range. But I don't think of that happening very often in renal failure. In terms of cholestasis, um, I guess I just don't have a good answer for that. We seldom lower our IV lipid infusion rate when babies are, have cholestatic jaundice. We continue the same lipid infusion rate. Um, in terms of the, uh, the question of, of the baby with severe cholestasis, uh, I, I think Professor Hay emphasize the, the best approach, which is enteral feeding, because that's going to improve it. But uh, in the rare case where you truly can't put anything through the gut, uh, you have a difficult problem, and you have to provide parenteral nutrition. And uh, there's no good evidence that decreasing the rate of lipid infusion is going to help that get better faster. Nevertheless, we do it sometimes because our surgeons ask us to. So we might uh, decrease the uh, lipid infusion rate for a while as we're making the transition to to enteral feeding. But the, as far as I know, there's no good evidence to support that. One other approach that some people are trying is to use a fish oil preparation in uh, babies who are uh, who do have at least a partially intact gastro uh, gastrointestinal tract, and uh, this has not been very well studied yet. The, uh, uh, people have done this off-label. We've done this with three babies in our neonatal intensive care unit off-label where we have given a, a drug called Loveza. And Loveza is something that is uh, actually utilized in adults for treatment of uh, hyperlipidemia. And it's a fish oil preparation. And we have, uh, it's a fish oil preparation that we have tried in a, a few babies with uh, cholestasis. We've had some interesting results in uh, two of the three babies, uh, uh, fairly uh, impressive looking results. But again, this is not something that I would uh, recommend because it has not been studied, but we, we used it in uh, very, very sick, highly cholestatic babies. There, there are also some intravenous uh, lipid emulsions made from fish oil or that contain fish oil that are being studied and that show great promise. So I, I, I wish I would have known you were doing that. I would have collected some blood <laughs> from those babies. And why I say that is because, if I'm correct, that medication, the, the DHA, the fat, is actually an ethyl ester rather than the triglyceride version. In some, um, in some you know, studies that we're doing in the lab, the body actually handles those very differently. So it would be interesting to see, again, just to understand sort of what you're providing and in what form and how that may impact other things. Um, you know, the, the, all the different lipids and the levels, they are, you know, they are competing with each other, and it, it does do different changes in the blood and the fatty acids. Uh, re remember, too, that as you, uh, as you monitor uh, the tolerance of your premature baby to uh, intravenous lipid emulsion, uh, if you don't have uh, serum triglyceride measurements available or if it takes too much blood, you can just look at the serum and see if it's lipemic the way we did in the old days, and that's better than nothing. You should give the lipids uh, over as many hours as you can. Stretch it out as much as you can. Uh, and I think uh, maybe it was Professor New who said he gives it continuously uh, unless there's a uh, something that has to be given that's not compatible. Our routine is to 
routinely order the lipid infusion over 20 hours because this comes up so often that we find it's better to just do that as a routine. And that also keeps your maximum hourly infusion rate down, which is really what you want. May I ask something to previous slide? Okay, another question about lipids. Not lipids, to previous slide. Uh, sorry. Do you think that uh, in, in premature babies need to supplementation for lake acid or can second for lake acid by enterally, by mouth? For lake. For oh, lake acid. For lake acid. Yes. And the second question is uh, at what time we must uh, start iron? In premature babies. I can, I'll, I'll take a stab at the oleic acid. I don't think so. I think we provide enough of that with the lipid. Yeah, it's present in the lipid and it's provided. So, and when I did the time course looking at these levels over time, I, I looked at oleic acid as well. And those levels actually did really well in sustaining birth levels from what we're providing right now. So I don't think there's any, you know, to my knowledge, any specific recommendations that we would have to change what we're doing for that specific fatty acid. I'll let, uh, what, what was the other question? Was it about iron? Iron and folate, but uh, folate acid. Folate acid. Folate acid. Folic acid. acid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there, uh, there is a, a small amount of folic acid in the parenteral multivitamin preparation that w that we use, and. Uh, but we, in my hospital, we don't give iron parenterally except as transfusions uh, because our babies are, uh, are on enteral feeding pretty quickly and then we start to worry about iron uh, dose after that. I, I know there are some, many hospitals, that, particularly in Europe, that do give intravenous iron and I think uh, one of the speakers also does. Okay, more, more quizzes. <laughs> uh, true or false, the data is clear that enteral feedings should be withheld when preterm babies are receiving blood transfusions into methicin or other vasoactive agents. Okay, the data is not clear, okay. Good. Minimal enteral nutrition has been clearly shown to increase motility, trophic hormones, and have other beneficial effects but increase the likelihood of necrotizing enterocolitis. Okay, so part of it is true. Part of it is true. Part of it is true, but the last part is false. Good. <laughs> Any questions about that? Okay. So with early nutrition and long-term neurodevelopment, uh, reinforced a lot of what you heard earlier in that day by Dr. Bell. Again, that early nutrition, early, 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 that's the theme, is associated with short-term, uh, a reduction in the risk of short-term NICU morbidities and long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes. But I sort of framed the discussion around windows of opportunity, and again, that early developmental period being one window of, of opportunity, and really trying to modulate, again, the environment many of our babies ex uh, exist and, and propagate and, and with chronic systemic inflammation, and to think about how your immunonutrients are addressing that window of opportunity, both immunomodulatory as well as an energy source. But the other uh, take home was that I, you know, I think there's several studies that are intriguing that the window of opportunity in that door doesn't necessarily close there, that, um, that there can be later opportunities in early infancy to provide nutrition in a way that brain development um, is optimized. Not that it's normalized, but compared to those two studies I talked about, compared to controls, infants in those studies, they were optimized with improving head circumference and improving um, specific uh, gray and, and white matter um, development in, as indicated by MRIs and other studies. So, so it's an important concept to think about later even after our babies go home. Uh, 
Uh, before we go to the next slide, did somebody leave a nine volt battery up here? It looks like a camera battery. Dennis, is this for you? There's, there's a battery here. Okay. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's a spare. Well, this talk was more for keeping everybody awake in the middle of the afternoon, uh, my fun talk. Uh, we talked about programming and how it uh, allows developmental plasticity to express itself through epigenetic mechanisms so that what you're born with genetically can produce a different uh, phenotype later in life depending on the environment you grow up in. So just as uh, Dr. Martin said, if you happen to feed the baby certain things early on, you might actually change the phenotype uh, to improve it. So we're, we're all on the same page there. Just to remind you that both growth restriction and obesity uh, in fetal development produce the same adult phenotype of insulin resistance with obesity leading to type 2 diabetes. So we should avoid both undergrowth and overgrowth. And, then under, and, and that uh, we've already talked about this in so many ways. Uh, uh, undergrowth leads to reduced brain growth and development. Fewer insulin producing cells in the pancreas and shorter stature. And these effects are permanent. Questions about this? So here we, we, we touched upon some other special considerations for nutritional delivery. Um, for the chronic lung disease, just to be aware of how our practices may have to be, um, what we do for the infants with chronic lung disease, we may have to think about how that affects nutritional delivery and how we must then modify or make appropriate changes to keep our nutritional goals in line. For the surgical neonate, the take home there was just that the energy expenditure may not be what you would, uh, would have thought to be increased. It's often reflective of what it was before the surgery, and so that there is a concept out there of overfeeding, which we've actually talked about a little bit as well from the neonate, and in providing caloric sources or calories and energy from sources that would just lead to uh, CO2 retention and hyperglycemia, making your management even more difficult. For the congenital infant with the congenital heart disease, Slightly different from the above two, there does seem to be evidence that they do have increased energy expenditure rates. Uh, a large amount of them um, do not grow well before and after their operation, and just to be cognizant that they may need some nutritional supplements or diff uh, additional strategies to maintain growth. Okay, hypoglycemia. Um, I didn't give you a definition of hypoglycemia because I don't think there really is one. So I gave you ranges uh, and uh, a variety of literature reports to support whatever range or particular value you may want to choose in your nursery. I simply encourage you to develop a standard practice about this. Um, but there really can be severe brain injury from extremely low glucoses that are very low for long periods and associated with severe symptoms. Uh, you're running out of battery power um, as well as glucose. Um, but that is when you have very severely low glucoses for very long periods with very bad uh, uh, symptoms with asymptomatic hypoglycemia or asymptomatic low glucose concentrations. No one has yet shown that this leads to developmental abnormalities and even if there were some mild developmental ab abnormalities found in some studies, no one has shown that treatment makes any difference. And this is particularly true for the breastfed infant, so I encourage you to follow that part of the Academy guidelines, which is don't need to measure glucose concentrations in healthy breastfed term infants. If you identify a low glucose concentration, make sure the baby can correct it on its own with normal feeding patterns and with a normal mother, with normal breastfeeding before the baby goes home so that you don't run into the problem of recurrent hypoglycemia happening at home 
where it can't be recognized and improperly, improperly treated. Um, most infants with low glucose concentrations can be treated by feeding those with symptoms that look significant, and obviously the very abnormal babies, the preterm babies, the very severely IUGR babies, they're the ones that are going to need intravenous treatment earlier than their counterparts who are healthier. Well, you haven't given us the number. No, and I won't. Yeah. And it's not just because that there might be a sneaky lawyer <laughs> hidden in the room. Um, I, I see no reason not to follow the average guidelines. And whether somebody says 35, 36, 40, 43, 47, 51, I just don't think it matters. So I would say pick somebody's guidelines that make sense to you, that your group agrees on, and follow them just for making it easy. So you don't have to have somebody say, well, um, it was 42 and you didn't do anything about it. Um, it just avoids controversy where there is no rational data to say that one range of values is better than another. But if there is something, if something happens and then you have a lawyer, I mean, you have a court. Yes, then you call me and uh, um, I get a call at least once a week. It's literally that often to review cases of hypoglycemia or so-called hypoglycemia. I get called by plaintiff's attorneys who are suing a doctor because the glucose was low and the baby is abnormal in outcome. And I get called by defense attorneys who are saying, well, Dr. Hay, you don't think that hypoglycemia causes brain injury, is that right? And the answer is, of course, no. I do think it can. So I get called by both sides. And the, this is a very common problem in the, in the U.S. And I'm sorry if we're spreading that around like we have Taco Bell. Uh, but I say follow guidelines that are published because if you then are trying your best to follow those guidelines and that's your general practice, then it's very difficult to have you be sued and it's also very, very unlikely that abnormal neurological outcome will be cut, will, will be the result of anything that you're doing. It's probably because of something that's already happened to the baby. And, and, and since Greece is in Europe, I, I think still in Europe, you should use the European guidelines. And somebody did ask me about the AAP guidelines um, where it says uh, if you are uh, late preterm and, uh, or, and or SGA, you should be screened for up to 24 hours. And then it says if you are an, a, greater than or equal to 34 weeks gestational age and an IDM or LGA, screen for up to 12 hours. Well, if you're 34 weeks, whether you're an IDM or not, that's a late preterm infant. So that shifts you into the late preterm category. So I follow that guideline. But I think that is confusing, and so I sent a note to Dr. David Adamkin from the University of Louisville, who was the author of that paper, even though it's endorsed by the Academy, and uh, I put him on the spot, and as soon as I hear from him, I'll post it on the Hippocrates website. But I guess the Academy is not about to change that. They're going to leave it confusing for you. <coughs> Somebody presented a baby today that had persistent hypoglycemia despite going up and up and up on the glucose. Was that, was that you? I couldn't help but uh, remember a case that I was involved with some years ago that sounded very much like this. And in, in this particular baby, what we discovered was that the glucose was being infused through the umbilical artery catheter, and the tip of the catheter was sitting beside the celiac axis. So every time the glucose was increased, the pancreas saw a, a surge in glucose and kicked out more insulin. So finally, the problem was solved when the catheter was pulled. Uh, that I don't know of. Uh, certainly, um, if you infuse glucose into the inferior vena cava, which certainly is anything below the waist, 
um, and you're infusing very high doses of glucose and you still have an intracardiac shunt, for example, you might actually end up with more glucose going into the aorta and then into the celiac axis and to the pancreas. But I think the only blood flow to the pancreas comes from the celiac artery. Um, perhaps there's some backflow if you went through the, uh, port through the portal vein entering into the liver. So there may be something where you get backflow, but that would be pretty unusual. Any other glucose questions or comments? So for my discussion on necrotizing enterocolitis, I thought two points were most important. One is just understanding that the postnatal development and the postnatal developmental biology, that intersection between nutrition, immunity, and intestinal development, including the microbiome in that, will probably offer the best insights into prevention of disease. But we really do have to look early in the course, again, of, of how we're managing the kids and how they're developing in the context of these intersections and that a thoughtful, rigorous approach must be employed to evaluate new therapies before they're routinely adopted. So we ended the lecture with a lot of different topics and associations and potential new therapies, but, um, and, and fun to talk about and fun to theorize about, but I think until that's truly been tested in a rigorous fashion um, before I think we can just routinely start to do that in our infants. The computer lost its glucose supply. <laughs> <laughs> Questions about necrotizing enterocolitis? We've talked quite a bit about this already, but there may still be some questions. Okay, Joe. Okay. Uh, proteomics, uh, uh, biomarkers, feeding intolerance, true and false. All cases of what is called necrotizing enterocolitis have the same pathophysiology, so biomarkers should be easy to find for all cases. <laughs> so I, I think the main point there is that what we are calling necrotizing enterocolitis is very heterogeneous. And uh, uh, you know, you have your term babies, you have your isolated intestinal perforations, you have other problems that look like they could be. Uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, but we're calling all of them necrotizing enterocolitis. And so uh, I think we need to focus more on uh, individual areas and call them something different. CRP, platelet count, and white blood cell counts are reliable indicators and, be can, and can be used as specific diagnostic biomarkers of necrotizing enterocolitis. Okay. They are not specific, okay. I think that uh, one thing that was mentioned today that they can, that some people use them <clears throat> to uh, look at the progression of disease, that might be very helpful. But in terms of actually using them for diagnostic purposes, they will not help you diagnose necrotizing enterocolitis. Abdominal x-rays are highly reliable indicators for early evolving necrotizing enterocolitis, and additional biomarkers are not needed. Thank you. <laughs> No, he had one that was true. No. <laughs> oh, no. No, that was mine. <laughs> oh, you have another one. I have another one. True or false? Many of the microbes in the human gastrointestinal tract cannot be cultured, and newly developed techniques may be helpful in helping us better understand diseases of the newborn. See? <laughs> Finally. Uh, probiotics have been clearly shown to be safe in preterm babies. Okay. I hope I got that point across that, uh, yeah. And glutamine is an essential amino acid. False. Okay. It is a conditionally essential amino acid. Good. Questions? By conditionally essential, it means that under certain conditions, such as high stress, or surgery, uh, you know, the things that cause a, a, a lot of stress to the individual, glutamine gets utilized up very rapidly. And so under that condition, glutamine becomes essential because the body cannot make it fast enough. 
By essential, we mean that the body cannot make it at all. The body can make glutamine from other amino acid sources, but, but under, only under uh, uh, stress conditions does it become essential, and that's what we mean by conditionally essential. Yeah, uh, the erythromycin, when to use the erythromycin? I think that that's a very good question. And when uh, you try several different things, uh, for example, uh, if you have a baby who's having feeding intolerance, uh, who you get to a certain level of intake and that baby then starts having abdominal distension, you slow down the feedings, you stop, you try to progress again, and the baby is just having the same kind of problems over and over again. You can try to uh, position the baby differently. One thing that sometimes helps, okay? Left side, right side down, prone, that kind of a thing. Uh, the other thing that may, may help is prolonging the infusion. Instead of having a bolus that goes in 10 or 20 minutes, prolong the infusion by up to one hour or two hours. Dr. Berseth, Carolyn Berseth, has shown some studies that show that there is increased gastric emptying, a stronger emptying with that prolonged uh, infusion. And if that fails, then a trial of erythromycin may be indicated. And by the, a trial of erythromycin, I mean, try it for about two days, and if you are not getting a response within two days, then stop it. And I would probably not, and this is uh, empiric on my part, okay, uh, continue it for approximately two weeks if it works, and then stop it after two weeks. Okay, that's just one, you know, pathway, uh, not very well studied in terms of uh, the, the length of time, but it would make sense not to keep it on continuously. I think sometimes we keep drugs on continuously, and uh, uh, the baby could be doing quite well without it. So that's just uh, uh, one approach that can be taken. If it does not work, then stop it then stop it, okay? If you do not get a response within two days, you will probably not get a response after two days. Not known, not known. My guess is that it probably does, but uh, it has not been studied to my knowledge. Kami, do you know? Yeah, to, to, to my knowledge, it has not been looked at with our newly developed techniques. Yes, uh, uh, there is a link to pyloric sten stenosis that has been seen, but the studies that have been done in Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, that have looked at uh, uh, the, the use of uh, uh, erythromycin, none of those studies uh, uh, showed any relationship to uh, uh, pyloric stenosis. Uh, that was not seen in those studies. Uh, it, they may be the same, but I, I don't think that they've been studied to the same extent as erythromycin. We have many studies of erythromycin, but the clarithromycin has not been studied to my knowledge. Okay.